hello. Uh, so the webinar starts at 9.15, so I'm just turning on, um, but it won't, the sessions won't start until 9.30, but just... Uh, okay. Okay. I'm going to mute it.
Uh, we are starting a bit late because Robert is coming up. Uh, he's the facilitator of the first session. I think uh, uh, Jason is filling them, uh, fetching them up, oh, fetching them down. He's downstairs.
I think we're about to start now. Uh, reminding everyone again that we have a code of conduct. Please come forward. Um, and session facilitators, please um, make sure you find someone who can take the notes and managing the queue. I guess me and Matteo will be trying to manage the queue. Um, and uh, we'll have a group photo uh, like at the lunch break, like when it begins. We'll probably go to the sixth floor to take a group photo and then come back and have lunch. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Um, or the floor is yours. Cheers. Just give me two minutes to set everything up and join the Zoom. And people in the room should also join the Zoom call to like raise hands in the thank you with remote participants. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you haven't got breakfast, breakfast is over there. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were waiting. So, um, so let's start the, the conversation first. Oh, sorry, the mic. Uh, let's let me start by framing the uh, conversation first. The most important part here is um, issue. Let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, is issue 51156. Okay, uh, that you can let me turn off notifications. So otherwise, okay. Um, is issue 51156 on the Node.js repo. It's, uh, um, it's a very simple snippet of code. Okay, and I want and these, unfortunately, okay, you, you, you look at it, okay, and you see, oh, I have, a, and I um, I have a promise, and I have an event emitter, and that event emitter emits an error on the next stick, okay? This is one of the most fantastic promise puzzles that James Nell loves, and I'm so sorry he's not here. Okay, um, let's invoke James now popping out. It would be fun if it just popped up and from the door. Okay, it's now. So the problem is that um, it uh, throws an error, uh, an, under, an, under, an unhandled rejection, and it's pretty bad. Okay, and then all crashes. So let's 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 try this and let's see. So this is the code. Yep, maybe. And no. And and then you see these crashes. And the problem is the um in one case we can catch the error if you use Q microtask, but the other we don't. And why is 
why does this happen? And why in one case, the code, this is like, uh, it's so hard to some extent to see the problem because you can see that if I run the same code with just the set immediate, which is if it comes from an event loop event, it, uh, it crash. But if we wrap it in a queue microtask, it doesn't. And we use that pattern freaking everywhere uh, for deferring things, especially with next tick. Okay. And this is uh, causes every now and then a very hard bug to fix and pops it up in our uh, uh, in our tracker, which means uh, a few of us needs to look into it and track it down, but it also causes problem in at the end user level. So it's if it's us, it's whatever. It's, it's very subtle. Like yeah. if you're in a set immediate context, then it behaves one way. If you're in a you know Q micro talk context, it behaves in another way. So you know it, it can work fine ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and then zero point one percent it will just not work, and you have no idea. You can't understand why. So it's really weird, and it can be process next tick. It can be Q micro task in inside of the uh, promise. Won't work. You have to use set immediate to get around the problem. No, sorry. It you need to use Q micro task to get around the problem. I don't. I'm not sure that's always enough. Q micro tasks are uh, uh, reentry. No, no. It's uh... so. Um... Oh, inside. You mean inside? Yes. Oh, inside. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... I had a PR uh, I opened um, 51.47.1 one, um, that added a new primitive called process.defer tick. So then we have a third way of doing things, which is awesome. Uh, that would then, you know, somewhat get around the problem by, uh, you know, always running last in the tick and not being reentrant. Uh, now, you see, it keeps. So if we set immediate, we can catch it, but that's the only one. Both Q microtask and uh, um, uh, next tick do not are not sufficient in this situation. And this situation is actually common, okay? Because we can revive this by using a wait, and and then immediately it becomes oh. Can you show the Undici request uh, pattern? Because we had this problem there. Ah, uh, I don't have that ready. So if you have, oh, if you have that, yeah. So stop share, here you go. Screen quickly. So I don't know how, how, how fun you find these bugs, but these bugs are pretty, these are so, a bit, bit, bit of a fundamental bug. From uh, yesterday, so we had this, we showed this pattern here where we have a Undici request and you await and you get the body and a uh, status code like this. And then, okay, then you handle the body. You do, you know, body on error or something. So it's quite common that, you know, you have a, a factor, a async factory method that returns something that uses a event meter, usually streams. And uh, zoom, sorry, sorry. I will zoom. Zoom in. One more time. So I guess that's readable now. So here, this can cause an unhandled exception, and there's no way around it. If the body errors in the same tick as it was created. Yeah. So, well, if it errors in the tick before. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so this is a very common pattern. Because... So if you return an event emitter from a promise-based object, so via promise, it's going to explode, pretty much. Like, there's a good chance it's going to explode because you cannot synchronously attach an error event emitter. And in theory, in all our code base, we use next tick. And next tick was perfectly fine. Uh, uh, no promises. Minus with promises, which everybody uses. So it's... <laughs> Um, so using set immediate everywhere is not an option because if you start using set immediate, we slow everything down to a crawl, 
because we need to go to C++ and everything is super slow. So again, bad news. So um, yeah, it's, yeah, you have all the, the, the different options here and none of them are good. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was mostly because you're trying to schedule a thing with Nextic, but Nextic runs too fast. Yep. Um, I see like there are two way out here. One is what you already mentioned, use QMicrotask. The other one is probably even emitter is not the, or like adding something to even emitter so that it doesn't throw when you have. Yeah, but you can't because you need to like the, the, the error event needs to, it's important that it's get emitted and be caught by people and it crashes. So, so, so you do want the crash behavior when it actually goes yeah. un, unlistened. Exactly. So it's the user needs to have a chance to attaching the listener before it explodes. Please don't get hung up on the error event. It can be any event. Yeah, it can be any event. So, you know, you could have a, a stream that you have a return value that is supposed to emit ready when it's ready. And then ready gets emitted before you had a chance to do the uh, register the handler and then you have a deadlock. That's even more subtle a bug because you, you don't get any observability. You just, something that should happen doesn't happen. It doesn't even crash. <laughs> so in the issues and the PRs we had around this, people were a little focused on resolving the on error case specifically, but that's not sufficient per se. So the, however, the path, like this is a super widespread pattern in our code base where we meet the error in the next tick. Okay. Like in a lot of cases, we emit the error in the next tick and everything is good 99% of the time. And in reality is also okay. Kind of all the time minus the few cases where those streams are returned by a promise. If when they are returned by a promise or those event emitter are returned by a promise, the, the world collides, the, 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 the streams collide and popcorn is being made and not a good, not a good outcome. I don't know. I, I guess this in practice is only a problem with event emitter per yeah. se. So we could do some special handling logic inside of event meter, you know, and check all the queues, et cetera, and make sure that it always emits. Oh. I don't know how, uh, yeah. V8 <laughs> magic. <laughs> it feels like something you could, I j just a hunch, maybe that, that like special event emitter behavior is something that can be fixed with, like that can be implemented with async context. I'm not sure, I'm not an async context person, but. Uh, Somehow it feels like it's possible to just punch. Uh, but that's probably, well, it's in global storage. The point is, is you're calling emit, which is a, right now, which is a synchronous method. Yeah. Okay. And you're calling emit as a synchronous method and there is no one on the other side. So, so, so like the problematic part, are they all in like the implementer side, like on the wooden G side, for example, are they like both the um the emit and the error are like all those closures are all in your own code? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's on. It's it, right now in in this we found this inside Undici, but it can be in any of our users' code, so and it, they will not know. They will not realize um, this is the problem. Is it possible for like one of the like one of like for the on for the listener to be? Part of the user call and the emit to be part of your code. Exactly. With that, oh, so that that is also like a possible pattern. Yes. No. This is right. what it is. Like the typical thing is, there is a library that returns a stream after a uh, uh, yeah, promise, and when you do that, or an event emitter via a promise, and it that event emitter starts receiving <laughs> events before. Uh, it's actually handled to the user, essentially. And uh, because the event emitter is fully synchronous, even though it's an event, it, okay, but it's full, you know, it's one of those things where names makes no sense. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's it. So I don't, I have no, I know, I have no good answer here. 
on on this. I have no. Um, this is a brainstorming session on this is the problem and uh, um, API wise uh, it's not great. So uh, would it be like that if we need to design node today? Hell no. Okay, um, but um, this is our word remaining from when we bolted promises onto node. So um, I don't know. So Roy. Hmm? <laughs> okay, something that is hopefully useful to start a brainstorming session, but you know, a very dumb idea. But coming from the point of view of you know user land, like, isn't like why don't you have a different API for synchronous versus async? Right? Like, I mean, it's not, it's not solving the problem in core, but uh, maybe the Maybe a way to fix it is like point to documentation that tells user to explicitly separate the sync and async paths. Like, let me rephrase this. So, if I understand your solution, is tell people to not mix event emitter and promises, and be put a very good warning on top of it, and a cool explanation on how to fix the the, the problem in case you have the problem. Okay. Well, it's not. It's not. The, the, the problem I have with this is this pattern is quite intuitive. Like you would intuitively do this. It, it, there's, there's nothing that says it feels no, wrong. What, so, yeah. what what uh, um, Rui was saying is uh, you can do the pattern. Okay, um, you can document how the man, the author of the meet that the create the meet logic would fix it. Okay. Because we know how to fix this. We fix this in UN, which is not a rocket science. Okay. Stick a set immediate in it and then you're done. Okay, but you need to be careful of what you do. Um like I'm curious how many are like I don't know, new code, like new users, how many of them are still doing process next instead of Q microtask? Yeah, but uh, Q microtask has the same problem. Oh. <laughs> but, Wait. So, oh, so you do, if you do this, is oh, okay. So it's, it's yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. So one of the fixes that I proposed, it's it's uh, I reordered. So the the problem stems from a specific. Can you open that up? Have you got it? Um, there is a a potential problem here uh, on. So you, that's a diff, okay? That's the, the, the tiny diff of it. Yeah, I, I put in the, uh, yeah, just, it was just the diff. Okay, so this is the, the task queue function with, that we had. I don't know if you remember, any of you have d d d dwelled into these very strange areas of, of Node. Uh, basically, currently we run, we do run microtask from the, the promises after the first run of the next tick. And I moved it before, and that fixed the problem for everybody. Breaks everybody. <laughs> you change the order. You change the order. So of all the things. Uh, like I actually think that um, adding yet another API, but keeping it private, could be like. Um, a good solution for our code base, and then we uh, deprecate or like we put a process next stick as legacy. So the like the like they are like users already have ways to schedule asynchronous tasks. So um, like we we can just uh, remove process next stick slowly. Most of the coding node does not suffer from this problem because we do not mix event emitter and promises. And this is the so internally we don't have the bug. And what if we just um like, like probably um probably in like in, mark um uh, show up process uh, next stick as legacy depre document deprecate it with time like remove it from people's so, but what base. you refer you refer you 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 introduce use this is the fertic no no do you like uh, we can keep it private uh, we cannot expose it to user land. so Sorry. they already have um. Sorry. So, Mike, 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 Mike. Yeah. So, like, this is, I believe, primarily a problem in libraries. 
that, that you know, somebody, like on Ditchy, somebody implements a async API that returns an event emitter somehow, and maybe in user code. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's a huge issue um, in core. There's another thing here also that is a little tangent is that uh, the common knowledge is that process next pick always runs before Q micro tasks, but that's not true. So we, 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 we haven't documented that in Node.js, maybe in the new website, I don't actually know, but there are a lot of you know, online resources that explain the node event loop and et cetera. And everybody, the, the common knowledge out there is that next tick always run before Q micro task, which is usually true, but not always, depending on your current execution context. So it's, it's a total brain fuck. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I apologize, uh, so much apologize. Uh, and then there's a third thing to keep in mind is uh, process next tick will slow down all calls from native code back to JavaScript because of async hooks. So if you have a thing on the next tick queue, that will have a performance impact on calling from native to JavaScript. So that would also be an argument to, you know, try to move away from next tick, but that's, a uh, little off topic, I guess. So, uh, you just have a quick question. This is only happening when you return the event emitter within a promise or the very first execution of that. Uh... Yeah, it's it's the, 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 the problem is you return an event emitter from a promise, mm -hmm. okay? And you, from a user perspective, you there is this pattern that was ingrained and explained in a lot of different places to use next tick or Q micro task to defer to the next one. The problem is there can be an unlimited amount of ticks of micro tick, almost unlimited, okay, before a end user code reaches the uh, uh, is called because it can be nested inside a lot of async functions. Um... Uh, I think there are some working progress, like web APIs who are scheduling lower priority tasks. Uh, if you're looking into implementing some kind of deferred tech, it might be better to like implement some kind of web API that's being drafted instead of like inventing another <laughs> new one. Uh, I, I think I've found something before, which was a feature request proposed by Isaac actually, but I don't, I'm not sure if that's the right, because, because there was something called schedule, yeah, uh, do, request idle, yeah, request do, idle. Yeah, whoever's screen sharing, the scheduler API is the kind of. Yeah, there's also scheduler API, yeah. Yeah, it is not this, it's this w, W3C scheduler API to the person who's screen sharing and trying to look for the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. There, there are two. One of them is request idle callback, which is probably not what we want. That, that's also that's, like a valid request, but probably not for yeah, this. Yeah, that's but... about when the request, the, the event queue has nothing in it. Yeah, is yeah, Is that yeah. what you're talking about? No, but like we're trying to fix a ordering problem so that you have something that runs after the micro tasks. Is that correct? Oh, this is this is a different problem from what the scheduler API does. Oh. Sorry for uh, the everybody wants to run last, uh, and it's not so it becomes like not a very coherent concept. You could make your own kind of event queue that comes after the other micro task queue, but it's it's yeah. So it's not about being last, okay? It's about being last from the time it was called. Um, so. It's yeah. This is what Rana was was proposing. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because wait, I I don't think that's what happened. Yeah, this is what Rana was because one of the you know solution, but was slow was that set immediate set set immediate and set immediate is kind of like request idle, even though it's probably low. But set immediate is basically run when when it's like in the next event loop. In original, so it's kind of like I do, not really, but the concept is similar. Uh, you're, you're running in the next, next it, it, set, set immediate is significantly later and significantly more over it, which might be the solution here. It's just document it, and if you need to do it, do it this way. Okay, but it's, it's going to be. Uh, significantly to add some significant overhead to the things. I, I think that's for the error, 
request title callback is significantly later than set immediate. Yeah, so we could go with set immediate. It would solve the you know the error case, which we would hope is not the hot path. But you know, it's 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 an ugly solution that you would kind of hope there was something better. Uh, Matteo had a very great point. Also, it's not about running last in the event loop. It's running last from the time you queued yourself. Like, uh, and if you run, yeah, and you don't actually want anything after you queued yourself to run before you. You just want to run after everything that has been queued yeah. before you. Uh, so it's yeah. yeah. This is uh, this is a thing that's been requested for the web platform. The request has not been granted because this. I mean, I think the only solution is what you're proposing. You have another queue that's after the microtask queue, before the event loop, and it's just kind of a mess because then, okay, what if you want to be after all of those? Like the problem just recurs. This is why the web platform has not added this API. I, I, look, I this I, we have when we when we put this, we work back for for I don't know an hour or something, a few hours on the problem, and then we decided nope, this is absolutely um, this is exploding. So. Uh, uh, basic next tick doesn't work. Q micro task doesn't work. Uh, set immediate does work, but it adds significant overhead to the problem. Okay. Best solution is don't mix 70 meter and promises. This is usually a very good pattern. Uh, so there is a so you know we, some we could okay potentially like in in the realm of of fanciness. Okay, what uh, we could think of is doing some sort of deferred event emitter that would uh, only um, start pushing out events after uh, a set immediate loop or some or whatever. But I don't know. This is very hot. Uh, so when you are talking about set immediate being slow, are you are talking about the overhead or are you talking about the timing? It's both like it's the two things are tightly connected. So you are one thing is about timing, okay? But timing means that the data that that thing is going to processing is being kept alive for longer, okay. which adds GC and other keep memory alive, so more overhead overall. And it means that I don't know an error path. Let's put uh, something. Uh, uh, some odd stuff. An error path to serve a file or to do some some asynchronous processing is uh, uh, going to I don't know resolve in one millisecond more on and uh, use more resources and then uh, the result is you know less uh, thing can be managed by that process overall. So that's my um, back to and it, this works for the error for for ready like for forever which is not a hot we can consider not a hot path which is question mark. But for other things like a ready event or a start event, then it's uh, uh, like doesn't uh, uh, doesn't work. But uh, thinking of what I just proposed earlier, you say that we can try. Let's say we can try to detect or uh, if they are doing in an asynchronous context. But what we can also possibly do detect which tick the event emitter was created. I do not trigger events and delegates to another tick. That's it. And that should solve the problem, right? Let's say we let's say that the event emitter is created at tick one. Until we get to tick two, we don't we don't we we basically we which is set, set immediate. Oh, good point. Like that's that's the easiest, I guess. I mean, I mean, nobody really cares because I don't think that people wanted the, the event at the same. I mean. Start listening to events at the same time they actually create the event emitter. It's well, that the, that, that the pattern we have recommended everywhere in our docs, and then people start using it inside promises. Yeah. That's, that's, that's which I still don't understand why they do that, but whatever. Yeah, but this is uh, beyond uh, comprehension. Yeah, beyond convention. We know. Well, or uh, we have not even said to not do that. So, but if like we an do... option can just be document the hazard. And add and add some utility to overcome it. But do you think that if we do under the hood, we will they notice or not? Hmm? Do you think that if we do this under the hood, which is equivalent to basically using set immediate, will they notice or not? I don't think so. It, it, the point is, the, the, this is experienced mostly by people by third parties. 
Yeah. So module authors that sit on top of Node. Node does not mix. Yes. No. No. I, I, I see that. And promises. No. No. What I'm saying is that time. if if we do the tick detection, will end user notice or not? I don't think so. E they, e e they will experience. I think I've seen failures that are triggered by. I'm pretty sure I sometimes there was once when I tried to do something with t ordering and I saw like Citron or something failing, or like some just some patches. Uh, just some company used CLI failing. I don't know why, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's because it's a race condition. It can whatever. Like it doesn't. I would say try to detect if there isn't within a promise and forbid them when you create the event emitter. That would be my best. It, yeah, it will break everything. But I don't know. But... If I'm reading that code correctly, can you do that with async hooks or okay, like async context, whatever? Because like if you do emit before, if you do that thing there, and then at emi after, and af after hook you. I don't know hundred. No, I mean. No, I mean when you emit, that's when you um add the em event emitter. You do that in the in the before hook, and then you emit in the after hook. Because like if we're just thinking about where you place this, looks like that's like because that's when you can call into user callbacks. Yeah, and theoretically, looks like you can. If like you have to like stash random callbacks, it looks like you can put the first callback in the admin before because that, that also causing to use a code. Yeah. So and then I, I, after. I, I try. I, I understand you. Okay. I tried to move this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, oh, so you say I you yeah. stash it here and then. Yeah, because like you can. Oh, maybe I can use this thing. Uh, I'm not sure how this. Is. I, uh, do, do you know how this thing is? I have no idea. Oh, I saw you use it. Is it? No, I had mine. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I had mine. Because, uh, like, you have, like, uh, you, you, what you try to do is, like, do the thing here. Yeah. In, in So, you theoretically, you can stash the callback. What you want to do here, and then when you emit, you put it here. Because these, both of these cost to use a code. And that kind of, like... E it's also what async context or async storage is built upon. Okay. But if that if if what gets invoked split between your code and user code might be tricky. Yeah. I to type it because yeah, I'm, I'm... you can type on my computer if you wish. Oh yeah. And just I haven't really read the, the the patch, but I haven't really read the patch, but uh uh just like things were brainstorming and looks like uh so Mateo yeah. wanted to like do the first thing, like uh adding an event emitter here. Like if we were just talking about that specific case, you want to add the event emitter like somewhere here. Well, this is where we call to use a callback, the uh, before hook. And then you want, uh, when you, when, when they actually um, emit the thing, you it, want, want it to do it here? It won't work. Okay. The problem is that the user, um, the event handler, the meter, the handler for the event emit for the event is added inside run micro task. So the run micro task is where the event the, the handler is being added, which is inside the promises. It's in the promise chain. Mm -hmm. And it's you're not running it until you call run micro task. You're not resolving the promise chain uh, until you run do run micro task. But and we, whatever happens before happens before. I see.
Sorry, Mike. Yes. And you said that if we defer the event invocation after, we basically behaving as a set immediate. No. No, we just break everybody. I mean, yeah. Um, so, uh, another options that could be like, to, to be honest, possible is, well, we document it as an hazard generically, and we tell people, look, if you are returning an event emitter from a, um, from a promise-based function, you got to emit those events with via set immediate because there's no way, no other way you can guarantee that that people will be able to listen to those events. Okay, this is an option. I'm not saying this is, a, it can be a, a, essentially documenting the problem is an option of last resort probably. But I feel it, sorry for the bug triagers. Uh, uh, another on that one is like we could keep it as is, and then people that are implementing uh, you know event meters, uh, you know don't uh, throw uh, on cut exception on error, just don't error or something, and then. Uh, when you register the on error handler, if an error already has been emitted, then emit that. Uh, oh, yeah, it's it's not about. Yeah, well, that will need to be under an option or something. So, but yeah, that that's an option. It's not. It's a lot easier to ship these opinions to the module authors than it is to the end users. So, if we wanted to do, can we do a lint rule? Or something like remember like for buffer and that stuff like one of the things that helped move the module authors into the right pattern was just like shipping some common lint rules so if we could if we could develop one that we could then start promoting to the authors who are sitting in between creating these event emitters then maybe uh, we could impact them early that so it a warning probably will be easier to do because that thing can split between different files or like different code bases. Like some of them are part of the library, part of our Let user me, code. Uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily com genetically convinced that that would work because it's it's pretty common for people to return event emitter everywhere. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Do we have a way to detect if the prob problematic behavior is happening? For instance, do we have a way to detect at runtime that uh, the event emitter could not be thrown because we were inside the same tick? Can we do that? So the so the problem is identical. Uh, yes and no, partially. Okay, the problem is identical to the unhandled rejection bug. And the fact that uh, an unhandled rejection could become handled later on, this is exactly the same problem. Okay. It's uh, whatever. It, it keeps on haunting us this. Okay. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 the reason why I'm asking is because if we detect, we can detect at runtime. We can behave like we already behave on event emitter. For instance, when you install the listen event, more than 10 times, if I'm not mistaken, you get a warning at runtime, right? We could do the same and say, dude, you're doing something you're not supposed to do. We, we give you a warning, and therefore you can see where this event emitter was created and adjust accordingly. Uh, the problem is that you already get a warning in the sense, in the face of an, 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 an error being thrown. We give the, 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 the reason. <coughs> yeah, but the, it... the thing is that now you get a uh, Uncooked exception, we say, what the hell is happening? Now we say, dude, it is for this reason that you're not receiving this. I don't think you can catch that. Like, I can't, you can't, ca you can't get that moment because you are, somebody is essentially emitting an error or emitting an event at a specific time. So before the end, so the end user wanted to add something to end of that event, but they have not. At the 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 the, co the execution has not gone back to them. So this is why I think a lighter touch will just actually move the needle more than trying to even the, like a warning. If we can't detect it, that actually just sort of ruins that idea. But if we can just say lightly, this is not a recommended practice with a lint rule that we ship in in 
Airbnb's Lint and Standard and those whatevers, like, honestly, that can move the needle a lot. It just educates people in their workflow because they're not going to read the docs, but they're sure going to read a Lint warning and then they're going to go look up, why did my Lint start failing? And my Lint started failing because I'm using this pattern that I shouldn't be. And that's like a really good education point that isn't relying on people going to read the docs. There's no people aren't going to do that. But I Because I think we could probably do a light detection. Um, I was just going to say, I, I'd really doubt that a light detection would be helpful and you'd probably need to like the full um, TypeScript ESLint parser in order to have a reasonably actionable uh, rule on this, I think. Come on, we had Josh yesterday and he's not, he's not here today. <laughs> No, but I'm also thinking that a lint detection is impossible because the thing is that what we are trying to to prohibit to create an event emitter within a promise, which might happen for very legit case actually. I'm trying to say let's not try to get it right. Let's just say that mixing event emitters and promises is bad. That's the lint rule. The lint rule is just like the practice here. Try to avoid it, and then it could have a docs page that says if you can't avoid it. Make sure you're running in a micro task like and that's it's a it's a docs problem. It's an education thing. That's it. And that puts it in the you know uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's from that. like uh, it could be mixed from like in different files, even in different libraries. I'm not sure a lint rule would be enough. like if if you have a promise basing and you call a library that has a well, so yeah, that was the point I tried to make. Uh, the TypeScript ESLint plugin has full or full-ish flow, flow control analysis. So you can make rules like that, but I think it'd be interesting to have data of, of knowing, you know, what percent of top packages are written in TypeScript and what would be able. You, I, and not to get on a tangent, okay. I just mean specifically for if it's a linting problem. That's the only um, solution. Let me see. show you why this is. I don't, may may I just type this? Just a second. Okay. So I don't think I don't think you can we can do it, okay? Because consider this function. Okay, let's 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 do that. Okay, so where is it? Uh, okay, where is the? Uh, perfect, <laughs> amazing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, we have this. Okay, so let's imagine we do something like uh, fs create uh, read stream. Okay. And we have this is get file name. Okay, so let's say we have fi ooh, file name, and we have await get file name for whatever reason this does gives must give us the file name. Okay, and now we do fs grid create read stream file name. This is an event emitter, and now you return the stream. And here we go, we have our hazard. And, so, and now you can see this is the hazard that we are talking about in a very fancy way. File name does not exist, but you don't know. And here you get the hazard, and this will, will get you an uncaught exception. <laughs> and now you see this is real, okay? Like the code above was, was fake. This is absolutely real. And the very first moment, which is this stream, can emit errors without triggering an uncaught exception is set immediate. Yeah. Next tick, cute from microtask will always result in an handled rejection. Uh, sorry, an handled exception. Yeah. I see. Fun. I know, uh, as I said, uh, now you see where the pro, like, this is, uh, this is the problem that, that, that we have. It's not, I hope it's a guy substantiated it more probably with the FS example. Okay, it's uh, uh, so. Um, I was just wondering since only the error event creates a problem because if, for instance, if you skip one of the other events, might not or not, might not be a problem. Do, oh, well, actually, 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 you know, you're, you're right. It's impossible to. No, because I was thinking we might just defer the error event to the next uh, tick and treat the other one like nothing happened. Maybe, but it's bold, bold idea. 
random idea. Just add a simple property to the error object to make it got emitted, I don't know, thrown later. <laughs> yeah. That was my earlier proposal, but is uh, basically equivalent to the set immediate, which is so. Yeah, go for it. What what we could do, okay, is apart from documenting the Zard, like the Zard is there, very easy to see now. Hopefully, it's this is um, problematic. Okay, what we could do is um, have have an accessor like that. Okay, so let's say we have a function add uh, deferred. Can you hold the mic? Thank you. Okay. So add deferred, uh, emit deferred event. Let's do emit deferred event. A TT like that. We have the uh, we have the event emitter and the name of the event and the value. Okay. And then. Okay. So what we can do is something like this. Okay. Uh, if it has a listener count, uh, okay, we do we do this kind of we can do this kind of things, and oh, sorry, okay, then we can do ee on um, add listener. Uh, because we emit an event when where is the thing? Okay, here, great. So we 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 emit an event. Okay. So if this is the case that happens, yep, we can emit the value very aggressively. Okay. Or like do this. Yeah, this will break though if that uh, somebody. Uh, there already is a listener from the internal implementation or something. Uh, well, yeah, but that's a different problem. Okay. It's a, uh, uh, we'll solve the user problem. Uh, like this. Hmm? Uh, because... Oh, I see. I see. I... But who, who is calling emit, emit different event ourselves? Well, we can document the hazard and add this utility, something like that. Like, again, I'm not saying it's, and potentially use it everywhere in our code base, because that's the other bit. That actually doesn't look too bad. That solution doesn't actually look too bad to me, but uh, just yeah. personally. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, hmm? it's, uh, you can simplify to, I mean, you can simplify to be, uh, event emitter dot emit deferred yeah. since whatever, but I mean on the event emitter itself. But I mean actually it might be a good idea because once we have a new add a new method for some reason people will notice rather than reading in the documentation for the current problem as art. So if you say oh you know you have a, a this you have this new method for this problematic use case, I say oh shall I have a problematic use case? Let me review my code. I mean. Makes no sense. Psychology makes no sense here, but this might be a good idea. So I don't know. This is potentially a solution to this. I don't know. Uh, I just have a question to understand what's the impact. Like, how often does it happen to receive issues on, um, like, on this specific problem? And like, what if we just document it and call it a day, depending on the impact? that like if we have like dozens of issues i mean okay then we have to do something if we have one issue like every year like i think just documenting it it's like the solution uh yeah so wes and i were kind of riffing on an idea of uh if you like an event emitter it's kind of invalid to be emitting events if there's not actually any listeners on it yet so if you just buffer events until the first on is called, um, which is, yeah, which is part of that, but um, combining that with uh, denables to make it, if, if the first on happens, then switch to ah. start 
flushing events it, or if Venable triggers. It, it, won't, it, it won't work because you can have it nested a few times in the mic in the microtick queue before that. You return a, an event meter, okay? With a then with the, with, the, with the then method, but that you know async function can return like imagine the typical tassel of async function. Each one of them at the microtech, and yeah. it, it, this can be two or three level deep, essentially. In uh... what? Like it? How does that make it not work? Maybe I'm missing. I mean, it like if if you like create the event emitter and then like you will wait uh, after Mike, Mike, sorry, yeah. speaking to Mike. Yeah, yeah, like if 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 you like create uh, an event emitter and then you. Have like an await after, and then you return it to the user. Yeah. Then like it's yeah, sure, but I'm not sure that. I'm not... No, basically, basically you're moving towards Robert's idea of the deferred tick because you at some point you have to make have another queue that is a queue secured when nothing will happen anymore, and before but before the next tick, which is basically the deferred tick at some point. I mean, we got to the same. Yeah. I don't know. My opinion would be to implement something like that. And also document the hazard and call it a day. I mean, once you give you two ways to get out of it, it's on you now. Yeah, yeah. The the problem is essentially like promises have no temporality limit. Well, uh, event emitters are like if they're immediate. You if you're not there when the thing happens, then yeah, you missed it, and you, you can't going, reconcile the two. Going back to how big of an issue this actually is. It's very hard to tell because it's one of those, oh, it didn't work. Well, I'll just restart. Oh, now it works kind of things. No, realistically, what happens that, oh, it didn't work. Oh, let me change next tick with centimeter for no reason. They pass beyond the problem that we're done. Most of the, most of the people will will be able like that. You you know that, right? So so we might we might just document it and that's it. Even though adding that one would might be a good idea anyway. If you do like documenting it for no reason without providing a good solution, is probably not a good idea. But also, it depends on what we do with our own function, what we do with our own code. Like, um, like the uh, create read stream API in in uh, in FS. Should we use something like this, like this example? Okay. How do you? Um, what do you do here? Okay, do you change the first creature stream to use the emit deferred event thingy that I just just explode in the face of people? No, this is uh, this is the good question. Okay, I'm like this. Th th that's the hazard. If you start changing our code to eventually use that thing, it means that we it would be easier to change the way the events are scheduled. Code why uh, I mean the entire in the their code base to to wait for the other tick it would be easier if you if you start doing stuff like that because if you do internally node will also we will also break users probably so at that point it's easier just I just say even the meter waits for the next tick to start throwing any error that's it I think at that point it's easier and you don't need, even need the new method if you instead say I'm gonna introduce the the new method in order to prevent user to incurring this problem. Then you can leave the our code base untouched. Otherwise, it makes no sense. If you don't change our own code, okay. If you don't change our own code, if you don't change FS create read stream in this mm -hmm. case, end user will 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 have the bug. But if you change our code, it means that you have to change every event emitting in our code base. Think about. It. Every, everywhere. Almost, almost everyone. Everywhere. At that point, if you change it everywhere, it means that you're de facto changing the behavior of even the meter. At that point, it's easier if you change the way we process the queue. Well, the, no, because we are not entering, altering people's code. So it's... Uh, but it's a horrible effort for us to change everywhere. Well, look, I'm not... I, I, as I said, I, we scheduled the session because there was no good solution. Oh, if it was easy, we will not schedule the session. <laughs> I, I, I would break the users, folks. I'm sorry. I am. Uh, this is. I, I have no. I, I have no good answer. Like 
the 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 blanket is so short that everything we pull is is um, something stays out. So it's, it's literally we have. Li it, it took me and Matteo an hour to even figure out what what was happening when we noticed this first. Uh, at this point, I would say we introduced the method, and we also try to introduce runtime detection to issue a warning. Probably is the the best. You you can, for instance, you can do that because uh, since similarly what you did you did here, you can for instance defer the throwing of the uncut exception to the next tick. Check if in the next tick you now have a listener, and you can you should uh, tell the user say you know what you inserted the listener at the wrong time. It's too late now, and that's it. Because you, if you defer the uncut exception to the next tick, nothing really happens probably. Like what I propose is to. Um move internally from uh, process next stick to defer just internally document the behavior provide um, like a small solution without have, doing nothing extremely fancy like live detection and then move from there and see what's the like you well, how users react to this change and if it requires something more uh, from our side or not the deferred is this or the deferred, so we add the deferred tick. Yeah, the process deferred tick. So yes. the, the other option is add deferred tick. But okay. not, not publicly. So let's do this publicly. Let's, let's also add it publicly so the you to, so module authors can avoid introducing this problem. Yet to their user. another scheduling uh, API. I know that's that's the issue. I agree. That's the issue. I, I have no again, uh, like. Either you put something, you change the scheduling. So to summarize, either you change the scheduling, good, so no, or not good, whatever, not good, break everybody, okay, good. or you uh, change, uh, add a new API to uh, do this deferred pattern in a slightly better way, but uh, without, uh, in a slightly better way, without the um uh, and change all of node core <laughs> and or just uh, uh one option is documented and yolo this is <laughs> uh, yeah. um, uh, an option to be honest it says do not return event emitter so uh our session is up okay well i don't know i hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, dwell into the beast it's yeah. it's uh, um, think about this problem. I don't know what uh, I don't see a good answer. Possibly the starting point is to just document the problem and put a big hazard thing. Do not do this. Uh, adding the uh, add deferred thingy that I just done. It not might not be a bad idea. Okay, so that you can people can you authors can say did it, this exist. So you, yeah. you can't sleep at night, you have something to do. Yeah. <laughs> sleep on it. <laughs> Great. There's an issue. Yeah. Uh, and there is a and there is a Okay, I guess uh, next session is mine. Uh, so um, I propose this session to share a bit of knowledge about how native memory management works. Uh, so one of my main motivation was that there was this annoying import module dynamically bug that has uh, been like bugging people for two years and many users got stuck with 16 even after it was end of life um, because of this bug. Um, and there were a lot of complaints from users about this, it, this was not prioritized. So uh, last year, I happened to find the fix or workaround for this. So I'm hoping I can spread 
the knowledge a bit about this dark corner <laughs> of no core. Um, and hopefully in the future, like more people can, you know, try to help with bugs like this. Um, so um, also I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the oil pan migration that I've been working on lately, which can help to avoid this kind of bug from happening. Um, and uh, finally, I think we can brainstorm a bit about how we can improve memory diagnostics. Uh, so um, here is an short introduction about how native memory management works in Gore. Um, so internally, there are many JavaScript land objects created as wrappers over internal C++ objects. So uh, I did a you know render uh, ls and grip wrap I all these files. They are basically C++ files for those wrapper objects. Um, most of them have like the wrap wrap suffix in the class name. Uh, so if you see any one of those classes whether on the CPOP side or the JavaScript side, that's usually like a wrapper class. And almost all of them, I think some of them got migrated, but well, not migrated, but like got, got like thinned out a bit, but most of them inherit from the class called base object, which is in like the base object, the edge pedophile and base object that's easy. Um, so in case you're not, we're familiar with the whole architecture of things. Um, each node thread, like either the main thread or a worker thread, corresponds to a node environment. That's like uh, source env.cc. That's like where the thing is, node environment. Um, and each environment has a principal round and maybe additional shadow rounds because we are having shadow round integration upcoming. Um, but mostly we, when we are talking about round, it's mostly principal round at this point because generally it's not, it's, it's experimental. Um, so, uh, the, the principal round also corresponds to like a the execution context. That's most of the time. That's what you are dealing with. You're usually not dealing with additional context in most applications. Um, so the base objects created. Uh, belong to the round in which they are created. Um, and they are tracked in a cleanup queue, which is just an SDD unordered set with additional thing to maintain the insertion order. And here I copied some code from the um, base object constructor. Um, and as you can see, like to, to bookkeep, we just like in the constructor, we add the cleanup hook, which is like added to the set. Um, so that when the round goes down, it just iterates through the queue and try to find anyone who's not yet cleaning up and invoke their destructors. Um, and the round is going down when, for example, if you have a worker thread, the worker thread is exiting, that's when it goes down. Or if, you, if you're on the main thread, when your process is about to exit, that's like when it's about to be uh, destructed and the queue is about to be flushed. Uh, so we have many different subclasses of base object with different kinds of life cycles. Um, so one of them is um, one one of the most important, like intermediate class, is handle wrap. Um, so their JavaScript wrappers are held alive by simple objects. And then the simple objects are reference counted. So usually to release these ref resources, um, that's done when libv notifies node in a callback, for example, in UV close, and node different uh, decrease the reference count of that simple object. And when the re reference count reaches zero, node will then notifies VA to release the JavaScript wrapper um, or like just delete this thing. And then, um, for example, the wrapper for TCP connections, TCP wrap is one of those. Uh, and then there is also another class of objects like file handle. So in this case, they are kept live by JavaScript instead of by some libv handle. Um, and the memory management mostly depends on the VA object collector. Um, so usually when the JavaScript 
wrapper is no longer reachable from the just look end, VA notifies um, Node about this, and Node would delete the simple object in a callback. And there are also some special cases like the binding data thing. If you do process binding in the Jessica land, the object you get is managed with this class. Uh, well, they're kind of like all named the same way in different bindings, which is called bind binding data. Um, and they're usually only cleaned when your round is going down. So they're usually just alive as long as your round is alive. Uh, so uh, pick the socket class, for example. So when the connection starts, like uh, on socket prototype connect, we'll create like new a TCP wrap um, and then assign it as a handle property to the socket. And then we add a back reference to that thing uh, to point back to the socket. And if you take a snapshot, a heap snapshot of this, this thing, it usually looks like this. Um, you have, oh, hmm. uh, you will have the uh, JavaScript to native edges. Um, that's like what we annotate in. That's like our code annotating these edges. Uh, the JavaScript wrapper kind of like just points to the TCP wrap, and that's like the edge here. And you have a back reference here. Uh, that's like here. It's gray because the dev tools will show any cycle edges as gray. Uh, so um, when the wrapper is kept alive by JavaScript, they usually call this make weak method on base object. Uh, at some point in their lifetime. And uh, the make weak up method makes the persistent handle to the JavaScript object weak. Um, so the just, uh, C++ object no longer keeps the um, up JavaScript object alive. And in the weak callback, which is supposed to be called when the JavaScript object goes away, we delete the C++ thing. And um, the wrappers that don't call make weak, um, on the other hand, they're kept alive by uh, essentially the cleanup queue until we delete them in some libu callback. And those who do call make weak, they're kept alive by JavaScript. So that's kind of like when you browse through the C++ code, that's how you differentiate what is actually keeping them alive. Uh, so current setup works most of the time, but uh, it's a bit tricky because um, many base objects have additional JavaScript references. Some of them also, um, like the additional references, are also managed using global handles and with weak callbacks. And that's actually kind of like a, a, a thing that VA suggests you not to do. Uh, like the, the header actually says like, just don't do any critical cleanup in the callback. Um, so if you try to like release the handle in the destructor of a base object, that's actually not guaranteed to be to be called. Uh, but that's what we do anyway for forever and it works forever. So uh, we just rely on it. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, VA doesn't always understand how we callbacks when when that happens uh, is is easy to run into memory issues like uh, the bug that I will, I mentioned before. Like uh, this is a case study of the dynamic import memory issue. Like that's one of those bugs. Um, so this is uh, one repo. Like there are many many repos uh, in the issue tracker. The, all points to this problem. One of the simplest repo is this. If you start a REPL um, and then you do a dynamic import in some kind of wrapped function and you trigger garbage collection and then you call that function, well, you crash. Uh, so um, the REPL, the, the, this only reproducing the REPL because the REPL uses context script, which is like a simple wrapper of VN script. 
uh, normal files, we don't use that. We use a different thing. Uh, we use a different path to compile things. But in the REPL, that's what we do because we need to compile things dynamically. Um, so in this case, we don't have enough JavaScript references because like uh, the context script, so consider like the this line, like basically every line you input into REPL, they're compiled with a contextualized script. And um, the contextualized script calls make weak to make it not leak, um, to only hold on, be held alive by the JavaScript part. And we did not actually set up enough things in the JavaScript land to keep it alive. Uh, so that's why, like, if you do a garbage collection, oh, well, it's already gone. It's already garbage collected because we don't have enough references for it in the JavaScript land. So it crash. Uh, that's issue. Uh, the repo is like in that issue number, but there are several repos that all kind of like ends up like pointing at, pointing to that thing. Uh, so what I did to figure out how to fix this was like taking a heap snapshot and um, like I create a snippet to create array of uh, contextify script. And then I just push them into array and I take heap snapshot. Well, that will not crash because I have an array to hold on to this. Uh, and then I try to like analyze what this convoluted graph is doing, like how the references are set up. And I noticed that, oh, no one actually, other than my array is taking, uh, is is holding this context file script alive. So um, that's when I realized, oh, I need to do something to fix this. Uh, so I actually um, refactored the Josh Grillan a bit to make sure that it's kept alive. And then it starts leaking because I actually keep this alive and there's a leak. So now you actually properly keep it alive the leaks is, is coming uh, because there is this like uh, there, there is the context device group also has like a global handle to a VA object called unbound script. That's like uh, just a conceptual script, JavaScript script. Uh, and this starts to leak because we have no proper way to tell VA to clean this up, to clean this global handle up. Uh, we do have like a weak callback, but it's not actually doing anything. Like in our mind, it looks like this. Like in our eyes, if you read the code, it kind of like should be like this. Like uh uh like when 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 this goes away, then this is supposed to go, go away. And we if VA can see this, well it the cycle should be garbage collectible. But VA is like, no, I can't see the right hand side. Uh sorry. Uh it just see like there is this oops, I'm not sure. Like there is just this out of nowhere. Uh, arrow and VA was like, oh, I'm just going to keep this unbound squid indefinitely alive then. Then that's like, and then it turns out that the unbound squid also keeps the JavaScript wrapper alive so that you have a leak. This is like just going to be there forever. Um, so uh, the, the, the fix ended up being like having to patch VA a little, like upstream of patch to, to make this possible. So that we set an internal fill to the wrapper um, in the wrapper and point that to the VA script. Uh, usually VA doesn't take internal references pointing to a script. Um, but so that's what the that was what the patch did. Um, so that uh, we don't use like global handles. Technically, we have like weak thing, but that's like a, just a shortcut and the actual reference. It's like the internal field and VA can understand internal fields. Um, so like this is now properly kind of understood by VA. Uh, so it can garbage collect it just like we can garbage collect cycles. It just don't understand cycles that involve edges with cross layer thing. So, uh, so that was a bit tricky to fix. Uh, but I'm happy that that was finally fixed after two years of like multiple complaints and emojis in there. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, one possible path to avoid, to prevent this from happening again uh, is to make use of the 
garbage collection library, the C++ lib garbage collection library provided by VA, because you can use it to create C++ cross-layer references that VA understand. Um, and if you create, you, if you ha somehow have to create cycles um, between the layer, like crossing the layers, uh, if you use the primitives provided by VA, VA can garbage collect it just fine. Um, so it's currently bootstrap in core uh, with some CC tests. Uh, Daryl uh, from Bloomberg uh, like started the patch to bootstrap in core and I did something to like make it end. Uh, so currently uh, I'm working on the migration plan to like migrate the base objects with to, to use this garbage collection library to uh, you know make leaks less common or like use after freeze less common. There's a link to the design doc. I can like I can share the slides later and you can just click the design doc. Uh, so as far as context file scripts goes, I have a working progress pull request. And um, with that pull request, if you take a heap snapshot, it looks like this. Um, so notice that the, the there's no like, a divide between VA heap and no heap anymore. Like everything is on the VA heap. VA can understand it is perfectly fine. Uh, and uh, we don't need to do anything to annotate these two edges. Uh, the the five and six, they are kind of like arrays, array slots. Uh, we can understand this just fine. Uh, we don't need to annotate them. And we can garbage collect this cycle just fine. Like uh, pretty neat. And also it turns out, uh, so I did migration for several classes, like prototype migration for several classes. And they, there is actually a performance boost to like for crypto. Uh, for the, I did not actually expect this would do anything for crypto because you would expect crypto to actually do something pretty beefy, like heavy so that this thing should not matter, right? This should be like a trivial part of that whole thing, right? But actually it actually matters kind of. Uh, so for example, crypto, Create hash can be like 27 faster. And then the whole hashing, if you do like a one shot hash with create hash, it can be like 10% faster. That was not what I expected. I did not expect it to matter. But uh nice surprise. Uh there are several blockers. Uh so for example, some base object does here does hold externally managed memory. Uh, and V currently has no API for you to like track them in the heap snapshot for the CBV, CBV GC managed objects. That's something that uh, I've been working on to add a new API to VA to like bootstrap this because we have this for base objects and if we don't add them, there will be like information loss regression in the heap snapshots. Um, and I, well, like some of you actually took a performance heat after I tried to migrate them. Uh, mostly, I think APIs that involves heavy allocations of array buffers. I think that that's probably our bug. We're not under-reporting these buffers to VA. Uh, so I'm still figuring out why. Um, and um, uh, as far as the previous prototype that demonstrated goes like the one for context wise script that also needs an additional patch to VA uh to support tracing VA data, which is like one of uh one of the what the um unbound squid class inherits from. Uh I have an upstream patch, so uh need some ground chips to get out and it, but uh that's probably the most promising path for now. Uh so I guess we have uh, maybe 10 minutes left. So uh, I guess for the rest of the session, we can you know talk about memory diagnostics of it, uh, like how, what people are using to diagnost to, di to to analyze memory issues. Like there are good old heap snapshots. There are several flags you can use. Um, there is also VM measure memory that can give you some hints about your memory usage per context. There's also L node, but it's kind of under maintained. So, yes. Uh, anyone? Anyone uh, has any ideas or? 
or like uh, do you have any any bug that's uh annoying you that's also related to memory This uh, oil pan API thing, is that going to end up in NAPI as well? In the... So I guess uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is to, because if we, we don't use it internally, uh, it's kind of difficult to make sure that it actually works. Um, and also it kind of like requires requires you to have some kind of trace-based C++ garbage collection library on your end to to hook into this. Uh, and that's not necessarily something that every JavaScript engine provides and Nappy is supposed to be engine uh, uh, agnostic or like maybe different versions of VA doesn't provide this. Uh, and it's the APIs, the ability of CPGC is not very, like confirmed at this point. Um, so yeah, it's just like, uh, it's possible, but uh, my preference would be to actually have something in core to like start making use of this before we can have a pattern that we can expose to Nappy. But yeah, we, we do have some something already in our like non-Nappy header to like set to create this reference like a helper to create a reference that that works with C, uh, no objects uh, to create a reference from the JavaScript wrapper to your C++ thing, because that thing needs to have a specific layout. Uh <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess if we have no more questions, we can, oh, it's 11. Uh, I guess we can take the, take a break. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. Project who knows this stuff other than you. Yeah. Uh, Chen Zhong knows. <laughs> Chen, Zhong. Chen Zhong knows and Anna knows. Uh, Anna just just showed up on the thread, but she's mostly working on MongoDB stuff.
Work okay, is over. Uh, the next one is uh, the release group session. I think it's uh, wait, who is leading this? Ah, wait, yeah, okay. Me. The floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, all right. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the this session is a release working group. Like we here uh, in the Collab Summit, like we, we kind of try to replicate a little of uh, the regular release working group meeting in which we go over scheduling releases and uh, finding volunteers uh, for each release. But I think here with the wider group, like the TID is also kind of like giving some, uh, you know, uh, some kind of peek into how the release working group works, uh, hopefully motivating people to volunteer to join the group. I think that's very important uh, in the context of, uh, you know, Collab Summit and having more collaborators involved. And uh, yeah, so we, we, we kind of have a, like a small agenda, like we usually go over uh, scheduling the, the, the next releases. And um, I can kind of start with that, I think. Uh, but before that, like maybe let's run uh, some of the you know, announcements. Uh, we, we, we also usually do that. Like uh, I know we just had the security releases. Uh, you want to talk about that? So yeah, yesterday we, um, me and Rafael uh, performed the security release and we have um, released uh, all, both of um, all three lines, so 21.7.2 and uh, 20, I think, 12.1 and 18.20.1. Um, so, yeah, um, like it was a small one, but please update your not version and that's it. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, yes. And uh, okay, so with the small agenda here uh, and then we have a bunch of uh, discussions we kind of wanted to bring to the larger audience here but to start the uh, on the scheduling uh we were just saying uh, 21 uh, current release is probably not going to have any further release until uh 22 any uh i mean i mean regular releases no right yeah so for the current uh, release i think the next one is probably going to be 22 and for that i uh i think marco uh, volunteered and uh rafael is also going to be uh working together with marco on on that one so is there a what what is the exact date uh, um and no 22 is scheduled to be released on uh, 23 23 of april uh, yeah but yeah great yeah i don't know uh if I can share my screen here, does, does that work for the Zoom call? Let me see. Uh... Oh, this is... <laughs> okay, I don't think I'll try to share my screen. <laughs> this is very convoluted and then there's not not much to show anyways so but basically for the planning here uh pulling up there's uh the 20 release line and uh for that one i don't think we have anyone that volunteered yet for a release in april we uh, we, we we have tentatively uh a release in april that can potentially be around that same time, like uh, around the end of April. So, yeah, looking for volunteers. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's probably usually here. What we'll do, we'll follow up in the uh, release working group uh, chat, and we'll ask for people to volunteer, and uh, hopefully try to find someone and and kind of still have. Uh, that ideally monthly cadence uh, working here. And uh, the next one is the 18 release line, which is in maintenance, but uh, Richard, I think you mentioned. Uh... 
Uh, yeah, there okay. are. Um, there's at least two open PRs to fix things in the 18 release line. Uh, one was related to a backport that changed. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was streams or FS related. There, there was something that was backported, and someone said it's changed something in 18 that shouldn't have been changed. So they've opened a PR to fix that. Um, probably need to find the right person to review that to, to make sure. And then the other one is um, we had reports that Node 18 were, people were having difficulty compiling it themselves, uh, and they were all they all seem to be on newer Xcode. Um, so it sounds like Apple have changed something again. <laughs> So uh, they, they, there has been a V8 ba uh, a patch that was identified and that's been backported as well. So um, if anyone actually has a Mac and can go in and look at that, I can't remember the PR number offhand, it's in the main repo, and just validate I, I, that it, you know, th there was a problem with the later X code and the, the patch fixes it, that would be great because I'm not a Mac user and we don't actually have that version in the CI. So, so the... The, the 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 builds were actually built. You know, Node eighteen builds are fine on our infrastructure, but people were trying to build it themselves on their own Macs, and they were the ones that were saying, you know, some the build was breaking, and it seems to be related to to new X code. So there's that, um, Michael. There is some discussion about one of the Node API things to do with the change um, about splitting the finalizers between GC, the, the finalizers that are allowed to do GC and the ones that aren't. There was some discussion about whether that landed, well, whether it was correctly flagged, because it did sound like it was breaking a few people, but I've asked whether the uh, node added on the API team can discuss amongst themselves if it's something they want reverted. And if so, you know, if they could open PRs to against the release line to revert that, because they explicitly asked <laughs> for that change to go in. So, um, I'm open to reversing it, but I just don't want to do it um, you know, without them actually properly saying, yeah, that's what should happen. Um, so yeah, th there's there's a potential of enough stuff to do, to go into 18, though 18 is in maintenance to do it, to do a release. So I might see if I can find some time to, to do that because there might be a small number of commits. Right, and then uh, what is the, until when are we supporting uh, 18 in maintenance? Uh, another year. So uh, originally, um, originally Node 16 was supposed to be end of life uh, this April, but we cut the uh, support short so that it coincided with the OpenSL 111 end of life. So Node 16, instead of being end of life in April, actually went end of life last September for, for us upstream. Um, so Node 18 is end of life next year, next April. So we've got a whole nother year of node 18 um we you know we we changed a while ago the uh active and maintenance periods so you know even node 20 that will be active until october and after october node 20 will be in maintenance um you know at, at the time that node 22 um be, be, becomes lts so uh yeah i think we you know we we, we changed the policy yeah, it was, a, it was a while ago now, but we changed the policy so that we only had one active <laughs> maintenance line because it, it has proved challenging, obviously, maintaining three three lines of uh, of node <laughs> and, and, and sort of managing the content flow in between those. Yes, definitely. So, okay, so that kind of like just concludes the, the regular agenda, but we have a bunch of discussions like we, we would like to bring uh, to the larger group uh, and uh, around around like the, I think mostly like difficulties like we have uh, as a, you know or the release group like uh, just making uh, the releases happen, and uh, I don't know if there's a particular one <laughs> Richard you'd like to start with. I'll let you go ahead. So this is something that comes and goes. You know, we 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 do periodically put out calls for new releases and people do volunteer and we onboard them. And then, um, I, I, you know, I'm not blaming any individuals because they have their own circumstances and everyone, you know, almost everyone here are volunteering <laughs> their time. Uh, but we, you know, we do find that, you know, we, we go through periods where we, um, we're able to do releases and on, on uh, the, the cadence that expect you know, people expect. So for those of you that aren't aware, uh, the sort of, cadence we've been operating on for a long time was that current releases would be roughly every two weeks. You know, not guaranteed, but that was the sort of cadence. Uh, 
for active maintenance, it was you know, planned to be one release a month. And then if it's maintenance, it was whenever we thought there was enough things to, to, to merit a release. We are struggling recently to keep up with that cadence. So um, there has been a lot of noise about No20, for example. Uh, and so um, Ulysses did do a No20 release uh, December, January. And then I did one uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so yeah, there was a gap for No20 where you know, there hadn't been a release. And um, people were, so, you know, there is an expectation that when something lands on main, that it will end up in an LTS release, um, you know, within three, four weeks. But the policy says in order for something to go into an LTS release, it needs to be on current for two weeks. So if we have things like, you know, we don't get people cutting current releases, then the things on main don't go into LTS because they're not yet in the current release for the two week period. So, um, Scheduling is always challenging, you know, finding people to volunteer to do the releases. Um, and there's always that balancing act between getting the new releases because there's, you know, there's, there's an, there is an effort to onboard releases into the working group to get them comfortable. I mean, I think most releases that join the group are naturally apprehensive about <laughs> doing their, you know, preparing the first releases or doing the first releases because, in fact, you know, there is a responsibility on it. You're effectively signing a release and saying, you know, to the best of my knowledge, this is sound <laughs> and should be fit for general use. So, um, yeah, we, we have challenges and I've spoken to a few releases about, you know, just, uh, off the hand, like, you know, are, are there any particular reasons, challenges that are stopping people, uh, putting themselves forward for releases and, you know, you get usual things like time. I think a lot of, uh, I, I think we've seen that in other groups as well, that generally people have less time these days <laughs> uh, to contribute to the project outside of work. Um, but other reasons is, um, so, and again, I don't think this is, you know, specific to our working group, uh, for general frustration with the state of the CI. So sometimes you can do a release and your CI passes first time. <laughs> Great. But a lot of the time, you know, you're trying to either rerun CI or chase problems uh, or, you know, even trying to decide is a failure you're seeing something that was seen before or <laughs> is it new? Is it caused by one of the changes? Um, so, yeah, I can understand people you know, reluctant to commit their time if they're not sure how long it is actually going to take to do a release. And, and some of it is um, actual time, you know, uh, at, in front of the keyboard timing and some of it's just a lapse of time like you kick the ci off and then you have to come back a couple of hours later to check it and then pass the results so yeah um we we definitely have challenges in terms of keeping to the expected cadence um it's hard to know what the solution to that is other than you know trying to get people to volunteer more or uh increase the, the, i mean otherwise i suppose if it really comes to it we might need to look at the cadences and try and reset things to 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 reality um but um yeah uh, the, the trade-off there is the longer we go between releases the harder it gets you know if, if things are landing on current but not making it into lts that means the next lts <laughs> release uh so just for the you know people weren't aware the last node 20 release that i did the one before the security release <laughs> that had 400 commits in it and i had to well i being responsible for that, I had to sort of eyeball the 400 commits. So even if the tests are passing, you sort of look at it and think, well, is there anything in that set of commits that we didn't want <laughs> in Node LTS? And it's challenging. I mean, sometimes you miss things, but you know, it, it's not just a case of you click a button and you've got a script that can just pull all the commits. Um, we, we have documented processes that say, you know, when you're preparing a long-term support release, here's how you can get the list of commits and you can run Git commands to cherry pick it. Uh, people have written scripts. I know Roy has got a PR to to do things. There's stuff in Node Core Utils, so there is automatable stuff to identify things, candidates. But there's still an element of human decision making involved in looking at something. And it's that some sometimes it's just gut reaction. Like if this has just landed on main, even if it's two weeks, which is our policy that says a minimum two weeks, you might still look at it and think mm, it's a bit risky. I might you know, wait for another, you know, let it stew for another release or so um but yeah it, it is it is challenging and even like yesterday when luke said uh npm release <laughs> three four weeks to get into but i mean most 
most people are looking for LTS releases of Node. You know, they're not just looking for the next current. So at the moment, I couldn't tell you if we landed the NPM release tomorrow, I couldn't tell you when that would end up in an LTS release because at the moment, you know, we don't have someone scheduled to do the next. Well, I suppose the next current will be 22. So at least that has a fixed date. Um, but we don't have someone yet to do like the next turn release. So until that happens, we wouldn't get that NPM update. And just, just as an example, uh, to get that into the hands of people that are actually looking <laughs> for updates to land on the LTS lines. So yeah, it is a challenge we have. So as you were talking, I was just going through the release repo just to see, you know, what I can find as a, I don't know, you know, I've actually looked at this stuff before, but I'm just putting myself in the, a person who you might want to volunteer shoes. And just to be clear, the, what do I need to do? And who do I need to be? Like, what are my qualifications for this are not actually listed in the readme. So it might help to put front and center, like the link to the governance. So I did find in the governance, but even that is a governance wording, not a human, not like something some person could just go and read and say, oh yeah, 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 okay, I, I get what I need to do. Um, so it might be good to like put together just a little like paragraph of, you know, or with a bullet points or something that just says, you would be a good releaser if you, you know, were these, or I don't know, some, something to like help get a few more people's understanding what they would be signing up for because that might make them feel more likely to do it yeah i think that's a good suggestion uh, to, to have something like that uh, one of the things i i think i should put out is that um we, we have released working group meetings and stuff uh, th there's two parts of it one part is obviously releasing the actual releases um and i you know i think we do we've got a reasonable section of the working group I, actually to be honest i think all of the working group are technically releases um I don't want to limit the working group to to releases. I would actually like to find a way that people could help the release working group without committing to full time to be a releaser. That would help a lot. Um, one of the ways might be like one of the ways we onboard new releases is they help prepare releases and then an actual releaser will sign it. That might help some of the way. Um, so maybe that is something we could open up to to encourage more people that, to say like you can help prepare a release. You do not have to commit to being a releaser. Because you know, I, I want to encourage participation in the work group without that commitment. Um, other things we've talked about, you know, just general trying to keep the CI. <laughs> yeah, you know, start with main. That would be a good place, and then you know, we'll try and filter things down to the the, the, the LTS lines. Um, other things we found challenging with releases is uh, sometimes pull requests are not labeled correctly, so. Um, Sometimes things are like features, but they're not labeled simple minor. <laughs> uh, and that sometimes we get people to say, hey, this thing went out in this version of Node, but it wasn't highlighted in the release notes. And we say, well, we've got tooling that goes through, you know, if I've got 400 commits, <laughs> I'm relying on the tooling to tell me which of those commits were the simple minors, or maybe I could spot that from the commit titles. <laughs> but, you know, if you've not labeled the commit correctly, then it's, sorry, the, the, the pull request correctly, then it's going to be harder to identify, well, was this major, minor, patch? Uh, one thing I was talking to Roy yesterday was we don't actually label things Semver patch. So it's almost like if a PR is unlabeled, is it patch or has no one actually evaluated it <laughs> as to what Semver it should be? Um, so obviously if you put a major or a minor on it, you trust the person to label it, then it's major minor. But if you find a PR that's unlabeled, is it no one's put the label on it, or is it just seem to be patch? It's 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 small things like that. That you know, we have a bit of automation to to do things, but the automation is only as good as the information you feed into it. Um. Yeah. I don't, oh. Oh. You wanna... Sorry, I don't know how to raise hands when I string scores, but uh, uh, so we do have like uh for for running CI we have like uh. Well, a very unclear uh, CI needs label but apply by default until someone eval evaluated whether it needs a Jenkins CI. I think maybe we can do that also for releases. Like by default, you get the bar to apply. Uh, same for evaluation needed label. And then someone needs to actually, you know, either remove that because it's a patch or add major or minor. So just a thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's something like the triager group can help with. I 
I haven't really spoke with anything from. Yeah, I mean, just uh, like from, I'm pretty sure as far as the workflow is concerned, you just add a line to make sure that automatically the bot just automatically adds a label. Yeah, sure. sure. While it adds the CI needed label, it adds the uh, Silver evaluation required label. Yeah, yeah, and then and then on branch diff, we can just skip all these all the commits that still have that label on it, right? That's what yeah, and you're... you can like skip any 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 pull request that doesn't have that label, which means it's actually a similar, uh, similar patch. Someone actually yeah. removed it, right? Otherwise, exactly. it's yeah. unevaluated. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. So what I, I just wanted to uh, comment to something else Wes said. Oh, now I'm blanking. What else did you say, Wes? <laughs> Took a long time to. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's what I wanted to comment on. Exactly. So, yeah, on the what is the, you know, ideal? I don't know, like how do you call it? But like, okay, someone just looking for more info on okay, what it takes to be a releaser, right? Like, and I think there is a lot of uh, unwritten kind of rules and expectations from with both within the group and within the project, right, as a whole. And I think like uh my understanding right like and i think that's something that is shared by almost everyone is that the releaser is like a very very important role right like people can just promote releases right like so it's a very critical position within the project so we definitely want uh you know people like that we can you know rely on we can you know uh and i, I ideally like that Either, either, either there's someone who has, right, like be already a collaborator for a while or someone who, you know, I think that for a lot of people, like someone who has a, you know, a career like in tech and like, uh, you know, doing something that might jeopardize their career, might not be a great move, right? Like kind of, kind of helps building that trust, right? Like it's ultimately the, and, and we all seen with the recent social engineering attack on the FC package, like how, how that thing can happen right like so uh i think there is that understanding like undocumented understanding and maybe we can work on that yeah the governance type of like or or even just like communicating right like it doesn't need to be explicitly a governance type of thing but more of a documentation type of thing uh, in their in the repo right for, for people who are uh looking to volunteer or just explore right like maybe taking a, a role within the working group to start with right like something like that I just want to point out the exact wording in the governance doc says there is no specific set of requirements or qualifications for working group membership beyond these rules. And then it, I assume that means that there's some other rules in here, but it's it's actually hard to tell. Yeah. So if that is true and that is actually just a bunch of unwritten rules, that's that's pretty problematic. <laughs> no, I mean, and these are like my personal expectations, right? Like, so what, and what I say is exactly that. I think there is no rule, like, but but like. We're right, like everybody can interpret. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I I don't want to delay Luke too much, but uh, I, yeah, just on that, I I can't remember exactly where that. There are something we've written down about releases because there was a whole thing, there was a whole thing with the technical steering committee about whether releases uh, had to be collaborators before becoming releases or afterwards. Um, so there is something written down. It might not be in the obvious place, and we need to sort that. Um, I guess one of the things I was just going to mention quickly was that perhaps in terms of qualifications, I'm going to hold my hand up and say, there's a lot of stuff we've talked about in this summit that's gone way over my head. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, really technical detail. So you don't have to be a technical whiz to do releases, but you do need to have a sort of um, discipline or trust. It's, 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 it's the trust mainly. And we frequently reach out to other people in the collaborator base to make, you know, if we really look at something, I could say, we don't know if this should land, we ask. Luke. Oh, um, yeah, I had a question about um, testing that you mentioned. Um, does this have uh, anything to do with the canary in the gold mine and recent um, removals of, of some packages? Was that able to make um, that is, well, I had two questions. One is that, portion of CI um, important to the release group? And two, um, was that able to be less flaky with the uh, somewhat recent efforts I've seen to to uh, reduce the uh, total surface area of that, I think? Okay. Um, shall I go? Uh, <laughs> Canary in the gold mine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it, it's a list of uh, 
I'd say popular modules, but it's it, it, there, there are some criteria for bins that has modules in Sitchin have to be able to be testable by like an NPM script of some sort. So you know we may end up using NPM node run or whatever. But um, uh, you know th there are some modules that we would like to test, but we can't test in Sitchin because they depend on things that we just don't have the setup to do. But uh, as far as I can remember, for as long as I've been involved in release, Sitchin has never actually been green. Right. Yeah, you run sit gym, it fails. Oh, was it? Okay. So what we uh, sit gym is important to releases because it is an early warning system. So the very important thing to remember at sit gym is it's not going to tell you that your release is good, but it might tell you your release is bad. <laughs> or at least that your release is going to have an effect that, you know, if it if some modules start breaking, did you mean to do that? So for, for something like a security release, release, maybe, you know, if something's changed for security reasons, maybe that module breaking is expected. Uh, but maybe we've made a change and for some, uh, I think yesterday yes. with the security release, you know, they found Express broke and it wasn't intentional. So they went and looked at it. So it, it is it is a way of spotting things. Yeah, we are spotting things in shit, Jim, that we don't pick up in our own no tests. Um, that's because the ecosystem does all sorts of wonderful things <laughs> with the Node API. Um, and part of the difficulty we have is it's generally failing. <laughs> and the question is, if you're just looking at a sea of red, you know, for each module, you're just seeing this module has failed, this module has failed. The question then for the releaser is, has that module failed in a new way? <laughs> if it failed before, and it failed, you know, if it fell for the last release and it fell for this new release in exactly the same way, then that's probably not a regression. So there may still be an issue, but it's something that's actually already happened. But if it's a new failure, then the question is, well, okay, what is that? Is it a flake? Is it actually caused by a commit? So in that respect, yes, it is, you know, it is important. In terms of the cleanup that Raphael initiated and, you know, others participated, part of that was just to fed up that, like, if this module is always failing, you know, so if I look at it this more, this release and look at the next release, it's failing in searching. It's like, are we, you know, I don't want to waste the time. It's almost like if that module is never passing in searching, it's just too much overhead to keep looking at it and saying that failure is the same failure as before. Um, one of the challenges searching has is each module tests in its own way. So they all use their own um you know, they, they might use Mocha, they might use Jest, they might use the inbuilt test runner, but they all output their test results differently. So it's not like they're all even app <laughs> that you could pass. So, you know, we, we look at the, the test you set on Jenkins and you just get standard out, standard error or standard out er, uh, output. And if something's got hundreds of tests, you hope that it's highlighted clearly <laughs> where the failure is. Uh, you know, some test runners are better than others where they, they put the failures at the bottom and then you can just easily spot. Um, but yes, in, in terms of the purge, uh, I think it was just a general, uh, people just got fed up <laughs> looking at Sitchim and just seeing the same modules again and again and again. Uh, there's two parts. One is some modules were in there being run, failing a lot, they were taken out. Some modules were in there, but someone had put in the past that we should skip these either because they were flaky or, you know, they do the things. And at that point, if we're just skipping them, <laughs> then we should remove them because they're not being run, but they're listed in the read, you know, they're listed in the, in the lookup and the thing gives you the false impression that we're actually running on those and testing those. So sit gym is always a sort of, it's supposed to be like a sniff test. And then there is some criteria in the sit gym repo about what is and isn't tested uh, in there. Generally it's, Either stuff that you know is popular because obviously the more popular it is, if that breaks, the more people are you. Uh, and then the other parts are things like you know, is it covering significant functionality? You know, so I think we've got some modules in there that may not be that widely downloaded, but they cover maybe something like Node API usage and that. So it's like a sort of general scanning, sniff testing of of, of uh, the ecosystem. Uh, we also try to keep uh, runtime. Uh, so, you know, when you run a test suite for a module, <laughs> it may take a long time. <laughs> and if you've got, you know, I don't know how many modules we're testing in it, Jim, it must be about 60. So, but, you know, if you multiply that all up, you know, it, it may be very well that your module can spend half an hour <laughs> running a test suite. But then if you add that up with other test suites, you know, we 
of you know, like I said, you kick the CI off, but at some point you need to come back and see if it's finished and <laughs> what the results are. So so even even if like the time is spread out, it's still like an elapsed time. And and if you're doing something like a security release, sometimes you kick the sit gym release off and then that's the thing that you're waiting for <laughs> to, to to complete to give a sort of I think a minimum, yeah. And but some platforms can take a bit longer. Um, but it, 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 it depends. Um, so, so yeah, it's a very long winded answer to your, to your question, but, um, yeah, I think sit gym is one of those things that does annoy us because, you know, it, it does require a lot of effort to, to, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at a sit gym thing, but in order to work out if a failure is a real failure or a fake, you know, a, a, um, and if people have suggestions as to how to make sit gym better. I think we'd all be up for, you know, improving that experience. It's one of those things which I think we're frustrated with, but we don't really have anything to replace it at the moment. And we're loathe to stop doing it because it's found real problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had one follow-up thought slash question um, is I was curious if uh, I feel like as I'm a bit of a, I don't know, release nerd, <laughs> like I'd, <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, the NPM designing the NPM release process and doing that. And, I've, and so I do also enjoy it because I'm also not a technical wizard. And so it's fun to, you know, design some process that, that works well. Um, and so I feel like as I also don't have a ton of time, so I'm not volunteering myself to be a release group working member, but I do appreciate what it is and, and, you know, have, I, you know, uh, more abstract ideas about how to make it easier. But one thing that I found is that um, as someone who, you know, does NPM releases and then those land in node, I kick off CI. Um, I've looked at, at Sitkim um, runs before and tried to kind of look between an old one and a new one and see, I was, I was mainly curious if there's any tooling or even patterns that people have found of ways to kind of look at an old CI run and a new CI run, or even know which CI, old CI run to look at and know if there's, if like new errors are, you know, cause I, as someone who, you know, yeah. like, um, yeah, NPM also has flaky tests. So it's like, I do it all the time. of like, oh, that, that one's Node, right, but you're fine. <laughs> Node Core Utils has a sit gym sub command under NCU CI, but all it does is it says, did this platform sit gym run? So you give it two sit gym runs, uh, the Jenkins. It just looks to see if it failed. It doesn't have the ability to say, was this failure the same as this failure? So it will tell you that between these two sitting runs, these failures were new in, in terms of they didn't fail in this run, but they did fail in this run. But it might not, it wouldn't spot the case where they failed in both runs, but the failure was different. Um, uh, who's, who was next? Yeah, I was next. I just wanted to expand on the policy change. I think that's an important one to provide some context and uh, explain uh, what what we recently changed. And uh, yeah, we did in one of the one of the calls, like maybe a, a year ago or or, or or less time than that. But uh, uh, we did had uh, some some external person that kind of like stepped in, jumped into a call, and kind of like, oh yeah, I want to be a release or I want to join, and he's self nominated. And so what we have changed in terms of policy after that, because we're kind of like, sure, like, but we, we believe like there's, there needs to be some kind of like, you know, uh, previous, you know, involvement with the project in order to, 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 to validate, right? Like that, that person. And uh, so we did change the, and we added a policy that people cannot self-nominate. So we do ask people to go over the either release working group members. I think, I think that is the, in the policy, the release working group members. I think like at the end of the day, like probably going over TSC members also valid, but that I, I, I don't have the policy in front of me. I don't want to expand into wrong directions here, but I, we, we did codify that as a policy, like do not self-nominate it. And in order to, to try to build that trust. Frank, uh, like uh, just one question that's, uh, is there like a reliable platform where Sijin usually almost pass? So, so on all platforms, they're all kind of flaky. Okay. Cause I was thinking if there is, uh, if like, I think some of the players are kind of platform specific, so you can 
I'm not sure if Sage and Curry supports it, but like mark it as flaky on that specific platform. Or like uh, skip it on a specific platform. That's better than skipping it as a whole, as in because people can get the wrong idea that it's no longer supported. If you look at the some uh, at the Remy, and uh, you can be more like this is currently not testing at a certain platform, which is the the fact. Uh, it's like due to some internal uh, infrastructure problems, but uh, at least that's probably better than skipping the whole thing in every platform on every platform. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, Sitchin does have the ability to mark things on a platform basis um, and, and a, a, a node version basis. So we could actually say that it's flaky only on this version of node. Um, generally, we have put skips and flaky marks on platforms that, you know, we have spotted. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's the general the general thing with sit Jim is it requires ongoing maintenance because modules keep updating themselves. <laughs> so it's not a fixed point in time. You know, if we, we have, I, I keep picking on NPM, but <laughs> NPM's in sit Jim, you know, NPM would do, do a new release. So sit Jim at the moment picks up the latest release, that, you know, whatever latest points to in, in the registry. Um, there has been discussion about whether that should be a fixed version. But the problem with that is if you fix the version, that might not be what the users get <laughs> when they, you know, when they run there, but I mean, you get whatever, version, but we generally run the, the latest version. So it does mean that, you know, if a module updates itself and breaks its own tests, well, that'll show up in Sitchim. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a moving target. Node moves, the modules move, and we are trying to look at it and say, well, what is the state, general state? Um, th there are things we've done. I think uh, there was a thing where we switched off running uh, modules in parallel. So at one point in Sitchim, we were just trying to install modules in parallel and run the test in parallel. We kind of felt that was maybe making some of the flaky because they were consenting for resources. So it now means that Sitchim takes a little bit longer to run on the CI, but it was only like 40 minutes. So it was considered reasonable, but I think that's taken some of the flakes out. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I don't know the exact details, but I could tell you that, you know, the last Sitchim run was red. <laughs> and that's probably the same for you know, everyone else that's looked at it. So you mentioned one of the problems with uh, with this is that the test output is all sort of different, and that makes it a bit chaotic. Can't we just tell people, please use this one particular thing that, and then like they can use their own for their own thing, but like making that switch is pretty trivial. So it's like, okay, yeah, you have your test command, and that's the one that you want to use for us. Please use this. Uh, we could try. We've generally not told people. <laughs> so one of the goals of SITGEM was to test, was to try and uh, sniff test the ecosystem as the ecosystem is consumed. So, all right, test. The way they test itself might be slightly different, but the idea was that it, even like the thing about saying it should be testable via NPM, script or whatever yeah, NPM. it was npm test to start with but then we said all right it could be any script that was um that was ideally to try and prevent modules individual modules having to adapt themselves to be test tested in sitchin was the design was but i think that was the original idea was that modules being tested in sitchin were supposed to be untouched it, it was yeah the, the idea was that we were just taking the modules testing them themselves. I think there might have been cases in the past where we've reached out and said to the modules, you know, is there a way we can just run no tests and not have to do the whole browser tests because you know, right. <laughs> we're not going to be able to do anything if your browser tests are broken. Um, but generally, I don't know. I mean, I, again, it requires someone to have reach out to the module authors and see if they're willing to make those changes. Yeah, and I think that there is that idea. Like, it's not tightly integrated. And I think sometimes... Even like the lowest bar we can put is might be already too much. Like with might put some of these author, you know, uh, module authors like off, and they probably just will not follow up with that. It's a flag, <laughs> right? <laughs> some of the uh, some of the modules tested are testing frameworks. 
So they 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 are testing frameworks themselves. So you kind of cannot. So they test with themselves. Test, so asking them to use the test, test runner or something to tap output might be untenable. No, sure, that I understand. And I'm saying the output, like the reporter. Yeah, we don't have to, I'm not saying. Okay, so we should, we could ask them all to output tap? Is that? Yeah, yeah. I think they yeah, do, exactly. all the runners support it. Yeah, so it should just be a flag of reporter tap. We could, we could just try. Yeah, it exactly. Couple. So I, I was going to actually bring up a slightly different way to go about this. So there are tons of companies right now that are doing selective test running platforms. Um, I don't know if anybody's used or talked with any of those types of folks, but there's some very interesting stuff that they're doing. Um, might be worth seeking out one of them. I have a few contacts I can try to reach out and just say, hey, do you, do you have like open source free plans or something, you know, they're, they're, they're very like, you know, company trying to sell product kind of things so far, but I'm just, I'd be wondering if like we could, you know, leverage a open source, uh, maybe one of them is like an open core or something like that. And, and then see if we could do some of, the, so they, if people aren't familiar, like selective test running is basically doing this sort of historical check and saying, ah, when this source code changes, uh, these are the f the tests that are likely to fail in a PR, right? So it does like historical tracking and trend analysis on on tying like file changes to specific test failures. It is possible that we could get some interesting results from SitGem uh, for that, which might help us at least filter out certain noise. Um, and if they have like an open source plan that, that we could just integrate, like it'd at least be something we could try. Maybe we, you know, fork sit gym, try running it with some selective test runner setup, and then see if that works for a few months, you know, or try to get support from them directly as a case study or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think it's worth trying. I, 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 I do feel that the main problem with this, like with everything, is time. It's 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 basically fundamentally a people time problem. We mentioned things like flaky tests, like um, you know, not this isn't specific to release, but like you know, in Node Core, we know we have flaky tests. There has been discussions about tooling to identify that, but we have tooling. Node Core utils will go in. I, I think Joy wrote a lot of it <laughs> to walk through the test. Yeah, you know, it walks through. Is it or is it not? It was. I'm sorry, but you know, it, we we have things to identify the flaky tests. We know what the flaky tests are. But we just don't have collectively. Um, it's it seems we don't collectively have the ability to make inroads to to get those flaky tests looked at, fixed. So it's not I didn't. Well, I say there is a general thing which is, can you identify? And then there's like, well, once you've identified it, what do you do? And I think that 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 is. There are things we could do to improve. The, the first side, which is the identification, and that might be where your idea comes into it. There's always the second side, which is, what is it? You know, If you've got something flagged, what is it? So I think the promise that these folks are making with their product is they have tools that will automatically just disable those tests after a certain point, or like it just doesn't report or reports like a confidence rating that says like, we are 99% confident that is a flaky test. Mm -hmm you know um don't don't worry about it and stuff like that that just gives you a little added signal so that helps you not have to like read the full output of the test so uh, i actually opened a pr or not core utils to do like it's still draft but what it does is um like checks the tests that have failed like more than uh, five times i think and tries to cite it as uh, flaky so next time it will be skipped uh, but yeah, I haven't had time to to finish it. So if someone wants to take over or collaborate, like you're welcome. Yeah, and to, and to your first point, uh, Wes, like anyone that like you know kind of has 
this idea is want to contribute to Sitkim specifically, right? We do have a Sitkim team within the work group. Like, so if someone is not, you know, comfortable or have enough time to, to be a releaser, right? Like maybe you can just join as a Sitkim uh, team member, right? I can help out like sporadically, like making improvements that, with tooling like that, right? Like, I think that's totally valuable, but in a general sense, like any collaborator really, like if you wanna help with Sitkim, please, <laughs> you don't even need to join that team if you don't care. But I think, uh, yeah, that, that helped with the first phase of it. One, just one other thing. Um, as far as outreach to module authors go, especially as people want to, uh, people as people are taking a, you know, relook at like where are their module or where is their time going around supporting some of these open source modules and they may not be super responsive. I think you could actually make a good case to them that by being uh, very well integrated with SitGym, the module author actually gets a big benefit out of that. So I know, like, for example, it was a big deal for us to get the Express stuff back into to SitGym because we know for historically, like, Express has made decisions about, I learned very recently uh, <laughs> that back in the day, this is just maybe an anecdotal point here. Back in the day, only a few things were in SitGym. Express was one of them. But none of the other middleware that deals heavily with some of the Node Core APIs was. And so the choice was made many, many years ago to actually copy the tests from all those submodules into Express. And the only reason that was done was for SitGym. So people are willing to do work to make sure that Node works with their stuff because they don't want bug reports on their modules when node upgrades i i, I think people are gen, I, I think people are generally you know they're, they're generally helpful so so uh for people that i know in sitgym every module in sitgym has some contacts listed against the module they're normally the people to reach out to if there were questions about them and generally people we've reached out to have been you know receptive to, to looking at things um i think it's always like the judgment call as to are we confident that we should be really, well not, not sure yeah. but yeah is it a real thing that we think is actually a module problem yeah. or is it something that's obviously um you know if it's obviously no sport then yeah we, we we saw that when trying to prune a few of the packets right like from sitgim and uh, that this last time we were kind of like we we're trying to but well, there was some effort to to improve on the situation and yeah a lot of the authors like come back and like don't please don't remove my module like oh yeah i'll fix it yeah and, and we've had others you know uh just the just the people people with jest were very keen to get jest into sitgim you know that's fair enough and it took a long time because yeah. they were one of those they had a test suite I can't remember how long it took. It was timing out in Sitchim, and Sitchim had a timeout of about an hour. Wow. Um, so again, right. it was kind of like, yeah, you know, they, they made adjustments. Right. They made adjustments just to run some minimum, some some subset of the whole test suite on Sitchim to, to because again, it's like it's fine if your module to I mean, an hour is excessive, but it's fine if you know for your own module testing you take however long it takes. But in Sitchim, if you're adding it to all the other modules that are being tested, the time all adds up. And it's kind of it'll, it'll all be fixed with that 200 milliseconds we save on run, right? Uh, but but seriously, I think we could definitely ask module authors. Sorry, I had to make that crack. Uh, we it, we could definitely ask module authors to have a, a target that is sit gym that is testing a lower surface area that is more reliable and that covers node core API specifically. Because I think a lot of these packages have tests that don't cover anything that they would expect to fail from a Node.js test, uh, like a Node.js change, right? And yeah. so we could probably come, if we came up with a good interface for them, so if it was Node SitGym, like if SitGym test is a package JSON script that exists in their project, run that instead of test. Like even something simple like that would then allow people to start opting in to a little bit more it, especially these ones that like just it took a while to get in, maybe they could, if, if we had that option for them, then we, it, it's, it, we're asking something and we're not testing it in the maybe initial ideal of the, the, the thing, but we're getting value out of it. And that's really what matters. Like we don't need to be, you know, ivory tower about like it has to be just like the users use it I, like if it catches I'm, something I'm, I'm not too bothered if it's called sitgym because ultimately for something to be run through sitgym right. it needs to be in the so for something to be automatically run in sitgym you can actually run sitgym and point it to anything on npm but if you actually you know just run sitgym all and it goes through the lookup table 
that lookup table has to be, you know, someone has to edit it and put the functions yeah, in. Absolutely. So yeah. if it's whatever target, <laughs> it's called Sitchim, but you know, if they've already got a target that outputs tap, that it's not the default test, then Sitchim's lookup should be running that rather than the default NPM test. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we, you know, we have to identify some modules that have things like browser tests and see if they're conduct, you know, yeah. is it conducive to, to splitting just the node parts. Yeah, I'll probably, if we, if we were to do something like that, I'll probably just uh, recommend something like more lightweight, like an environment variable, right? Like that they can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the, the, yeah, 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 yeah. But again, coming back to it, it requires someone on our side to yeah. reach out right. and, and do that, um, do that, do that. Yes. That coordination work, yeah, it's, there, there is work involved for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Mateo has his. Right. So, um, last uh, uh, last year, there was uh, um, some there was some changes in V eight or how we were doing some our shutdown sequence, whatever, that started causing quite a lot of modules to be extremely more flaky because of the changes in finalization registry. Yeah, yeah. the one you fixed, I don't know if you put it in in the first place, but the one you fi you think you definitely <laughs> fixed it. Okay, and thanks for that. But all the modules started to be extremely more flaky because of that change. And, and I, don't, I don't think it was obvious from the failures that-, that No, absolutely, like yeah. it, took, it took, I don't know, everybody for uh, six months to, Figure out what was the problem, uh, eventually, and and uh, and and because it was absolutely not obvious, because it's something that was, oh, passing I don't know ninety nine percent of the time, and one time hundred percent CPU stuck forever, and that was the, the 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 behavior, and currently this is still in eighteen by the way, so. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it fixable in eighteen? Can we backport something? I'm I think so. To... I think so. Yeah, but it's still super flat. Like it's it's very flat. It it had all the seed. It had all the thing that the modules in, or at least quite a few of the modules in CGIM becomes extremely more flaky. The tests were uh, started failing everywhere, and and basically, to some extent, nobody noticed. Okay, and it 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 failed in 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 a very spectacular way in took forever like again i i i put myself uh, uh more than a week to try to identify what was the problem couldn't figure it out uh, uh it was very hard like it was it was a very hard bug because it was like we were able to isolate it to to the finalization registry because it was also used by the source map module this gets gets odd odd and odd and odd in in uh, so if you were having that module loaded i don't know like all, all of this stuff very complex so the tldr is we need to try to prevent those things to happen again okay is that it's and and catching like those kind of problems before it's so so, so i think one of the things that one of the reasons that rafael did the drive to Purge. <laughs> I think that's the word. Things out of Sitchim was the idea was if, and it's a big if, if we could ever get Sitchim to the state where it was reliably passing, it will be so obvious then if it started failing that it's something. Yeah. Up. Right. Now, now th there's two parts. There's one is do we detect something's wrong, which we may have been able to do in this case. The second part is then you know, what's wrong? Because it, like we said, it was hard to see what was going on because it was failing in different ways. Yeah. But the main challenge was at the time and still currently, you run sit, Jim, it's red. <laughs> so it requires someone with previous knowledge of running sit, Jim, or, you know, to run a previous, to, to be able to spot that modules are failing in different ways than they were failing before. <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, if you all look at it and think, well, how do I do that? That is what we're currently doing in the release team on releases. So anything that people have, you know, people have ideas of ways to making that better. Yeah, you know, if we can get Sit Jim to a state where it's expected to actually pass, <laughs> even if it was one platform, you know, what Joy was saying is there one platform that we can I'd get yeah. to rely. If we could get that, then 
it's easier to get something. Yeah, once it's passing, if it then breaks, you can spot it's broken. If it's always broken, A, you might not spot it a new break because, you know, you just look at it. But B, you, you've just lost the, the motivation is not there. You, you just look at it and think, oh, it's failed again. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's almost like you get fatigued with such a, which is, you know, I'm not saying people are ignoring it, but you, you, your motivation has just gone to look at how women are. Uh, how broken yeah. it is right now. Yeah. Not, hmm? not even one. Well, I mean, it is less modules failing than before. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's very much a human problem, but yeah, because it's not green. Like there is already like, uh, you know, maybe 10, 20 failures. Like, so you have to compare to the, it's right. the As somebody that has a few modules in there, yeah. it's close to impossible to maintain, to keep it green. Like, because I don't know when it, I, I don't have a way to, like some of those platforms are super odd. Right. And I don't have them available. Right. And I, somebody can just add a test in one of the modules and uh, but, the, but, the but, test will start failing but, immediately. But the, flip, the flip side is that the module, the, the platforms we've got that are maybe mirrored in, say, GitHub Actions, like Ubuntu, you know, we, it's we're a completely we're... different environment than the one you get in Ubuntu. Like it's from a, um, a, a, a characteristic of the CPUs of the network of the drive. Well, that's fair it's, enough. it's completely different and certain. Hmm? Or is there or you don't even care. Yeah, it's because, well, it's either it's a very simple module that does no network, no, no, that does very do very little, very little things. But the moment, the, the interesting ones are the ones that start testing FS, are the ones that start testing network. And those are where the problem starts to be. And as a maintainer, like something that would be very helpful is like in order to get Undici green, literally, we, we, the only way we had to do that, and I think we kind of, is, we are probably close to, it's uh, uh, we have started running Undici test against the nightlies because we cannot, like, node keep breaking Undici constantly. Like, it's, it's, it's not, Undici test breaks every single time node does ship something. And it's, it's a good sign or a bad sign. I don't have a, have a clue here, but it's it's probably good because it means we are catching stuff. Uh, but, and from time to time, it thinks that we need to change to keep it green because no, that changes something. And the tests on Undici are very precise on certain things like network ordering, certain type of messaging happening. And some of those are probably overly aggressive in how they verify the order, uh, but it's, we now we have a cron job that runs it run the test against nightlies and open an issue and every day there is an issue open of undici failing against uh, uh, against main uh, uh, on node so and, that, and that's on that's on your own uh, on, on, on undici we had to, we had to move it to do it that way yeah. because otherwise yeah. from the the interaction we had in cgim it was not possible to because as a maintainer, I have no way to. It's very hard for me to test on the on the CG on the CG environment my module. So I I it's and also there is no way to know if my module is failing on CG for whatever reason. So even if you can automate that, that an issue gets open, tagging the people that are listed there, that would massively, like literally taking. Oh, I am. Running automatically CGIM every uh, on the latest LTS every uh, every night or every week, and if not, I'm opening an issue. Right, tagging the people. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, yeah. This but, is this will help people yeah. that maintain the stuff. No, yeah. they, there's no way to know. Yeah, at this point in time. So I think the bottom line is okay. There's plenty of work if anyone wants to get involved help the sitcom stuff like there's plenty of ideas in this room and uh no yeah we, we, we are at time here so yeah thank you thank you all for uh, the session i i think it, yeah hopefully like it will generate interest right like to you know from the collaborators to participate more in the group like and uh, yeah that was the idea so don't hesitate to come talk to us too later right like if you're interested in participating in any Form. So, yeah, with that, I don't know what's next.
So I think we're uh, heading to the lunch break, but before that, we can take a picture at the sixth floor. Uh, take a good photo at the sixth floor, like in front of the sample. <laughs> uh, so those who are interested in the photo, let's, um, yes, yes, back here in the area adjacent. <laughs> Okay, so uh, for the remote participants, we are going to restart at one forty-five London time. So about one hour and a half later, we're going to take a lunch break. 